Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we learned how to determine where a power series converges. Specifically, we saw that the ratio test can be used to find the radius of convergence of the series. That gives us an interval of values around the center x0 where the series will definitely converge. We then have to check the endpoints of that interval using other methods and include them or not based on our findings. The end result is what we call the interval of convergence. Now this process has important implications when it comes to Taylor and Maclaurin series. Wait, why do we care about these things again? Oh right, because they allow us to express complicated functions in terms of much simpler functions that are often easier to work with. Polynomials. So it's probably important to know, given a function and its Taylor series, where does the series converge and where does it diverge? We've already answered this question for some of our favorite functions sine x, cos x, and e to the x. We found their Maclaurin series by taking more and more terms from their Maclaurin polynomials, and using the ratio test, we can confirm that the series will converge everywhere. They converge on the entire real line. Another example that we haven't talked about directly, but we've danced around for several weeks now, is this function, 1 over 1 minus x. This function shows up quite a bit, and so it's important to remember its Maclaurin series as well. You can check that it's given by the sum of terms x to the n, 1 plus x plus x squared, and so on. Hey, wait a second. Isn't this one of them their geometric series? The first term is 1, and the common ratio is x. It will therefore converge when x is between minus 1 and 1, so it has a radius of convergence of 1. According to our geometric series formula, when the series does converge, the sum will be the first term over 1 minus the ratio, 1 over 1 minus x. Sure enough, it's the function we started with. Now if you want the Taylor series for a different function, I guess you could start from scratch. You could find its derivatives, find the Taylor polynomials, build up the Taylor series, and then test convergence using the ratio test. Oh, but that's a lot of work. Instead, we can use what we already know about these four famous functions. In practice, a lot of the functions that we work with can be obtained from these four using things like derivatives, integrals, and good old addition and multiplication. By performing these same operations to our Maclaurin series, we get a Maclaurin series for our related function. This is just like what we did a few weeks ago with Taylor and Maclaurin polynomials, except now we always have to worry about convergence. If I integrate one of these series, will it converge on the same interval? What if I differentiate it? These are the types of questions we're gonna be answering in this video. So here it is, folks, the big theorem that tells us how the radius of convergence is affected by things like differentiation and integration. Spoiler alert, it's not affected at all, which is really remarkable. The theorem says that if you hand me a power series with radius of convergence r, then we can differentiate term by term, integrate term by term, or multiply the terms by a non-zero constant, like multiply everything by two, for example, and the radius of convergence r will remain unchanged. Now before we jump into some examples that apply this result, I have one small but important comment. Notice that we haven't said anything here about the interval of convergence. Well, that's because the interval of convergence may change when you make one of these transformations. If you differentiate or integrate a power series, you may add or lose n points from your interval. You'll see this in the examples to follow. Let's begin with the following example involving differentiation of power series. We'll start with the function 1 over 1 minus x, which was one of our building block functions from the first slide. Its Maclaurin series, shown here, has a radius of convergence of 1, and specifically will converge for x values in the open interval from minus 1 to 1. Suppose now we wish to know the Maclaurin series for the derivative of this function, as well as its interval of convergence. Well, we can obtain the Maclaurin series for f prime by differentiating the Maclaurin series for f term by term. So f prime, which I'll let you verify is 1 over 1 minus x squared, has a Maclaurin series equal to 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared and so on. We could have also obtained this answer by differentiating our Maclaurin series in sigma notation. That would give me the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of nx to the n minus 1. Well, hold on a sec, Zach. Why are you starting the sum at 1? The old sum started at 0. That's true, but the n equals 0 term was a constant, and that constant got killed by our derivative. 
So our first term disappears, and we should start our new series at n equals 1. Now I know you're probably thinking, but Zach, if we started it at 0, we would just have 0 times x to the minus 1. It would go away. Yeah, that's true, but by definition, a power series does not involve negative powers of x. So to make this look more like a power series, we should be formal and start the series at 1. Our final task is to find the interval of convergence for this series. But to do that, we're first going to need the radius of convergence. Well, I guess you could use the ratio test on this series and find the radius of convergence from scratch, but there's no need. We can use our shiny new theorem from the last slide. The theorem tells us that the radius of convergence won't change if we differentiate our power series. The radius of convergence is still r equals 1. Now in general, the interval of convergence could change, but in this example it actually remains the same. I'll let you verify by plugging in x equals minus 1 and x equals 1 that the series will diverge at these points. So our interval of convergence is still the open interval from minus 1 to 1. Let's now try an example with integration. Suppose I want to know the Maclaurin series for the function ln of 1 minus x, as well as its interval of convergence. Well, rather than starting from scratch, let's recognize that ln of 1 minus x is very closely related to the integral of the function from the last slide, the integral of 1 over 1 minus x. So we can almost write ln of 1 minus x equals the integral of 1 over 1 minus x. There's just one problem. This is going to give us minus ln of 1 minus x. So we have to multiply the result by minus 1. Okay, now the Maclaurin series for this function is given by the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n. I'm going to integrate this expression one term at a time and multiply by minus 1. I get minus the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. My integral also adds a plus c term, which I'll determine in a moment. Multiplying by minus 1, I have the sum from 0 to infinity of minus x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. How do we find c? Well, we recognize that this Maclaurin series has to match the value of our function at the center of the approximation. So let's plug in 0 to both sides. If I plug in 0 over here, I get ln 1, which is 0. If I plug in 0 over here, every term from my sum dies, and I'm left with plus c. So we conclude that c is 0. This means that the Maclaurin series for ln of 1 minus x is given by the sum from 0 to infinity of minus x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. That's minus x, minus x squared over 2, minus x cubed over 3, and so on. What about the radius of convergence? Well, to go from the Maclaurin series for 1 over 1 minus x, which by the way had radius of convergence 1, to the Maclaurin series for ln of 1 minus x, we had to integrate and multiply by a non-zero constant. Those two operations will not affect the radius, so my radius is 1. What about the interval of convergence? Well, in this case, the interval does change. I'll let you verify as an exercise that the interval is now the half-closed, half-open interval from minus 1 to 1. This is different from the interval we had before, which was open on both ends. By integrating our function, we obtain a new point where the series converges. Okay, one more example to wrap up this video. Suppose we want to know the Maclaurin series for the sum of two functions, in this case, e to the x plus ln of 1 minus x. Well, we know the Maclaurin series for both of these functions. The first was one of our building block functions from the first slide, and the second we did in our most recent example. Can we simply add these two Maclaurin series together? Yes, we can, but we have to be careful about the radius of convergence. So let's start by finding the series, and then we'll talk about the radius. Okay, now the Maclaurin series for e to the x is given by the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. The Maclaurin series for ln of 1 minus x is given by minus the sum from 0 to infinity of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Notice that the exponents on my x's don't match here. Here I have an exponent of n, here I have an exponent of n plus 1. We can't neatly combine the coefficients when the sums are written in this way. So what I'm going to do is leave my first sum alone, and in my second sum I'm going to re-index things so that my exponents are n's. Specifically, I'm going to drop all of these n plus 1's by 1, 
That's gonna give me x to the n over n. But to make up for that drop, I have to increase my index by one. So rather than starting at zero, I'm gonna start at n equals one. If you aren't convinced that these two series are the same, write out the terms. I think you'll see that they match. Okay, we fixed the exponent problem. Both series now have x to the n. But now we have a new problem. This series starts at zero and this series starts at one. We can't combine them if the indices don't match. So I'm gonna peel off the first term of my first series so that both series start at one. I have one plus the sum from n equals one to infinity of x to the n over n factorial minus the sum from one to infinity of x to the n over n. That gives me one plus the sum from one to infinity of one over n factorial minus one over n all times x to the n. A nice clean Maclaurin series for the sum of my two functions. What about the radius of convergence? Well, let's think about this. We're combining two series. The first, the series for e to the x, has an infinite radius of convergence. The second, the series for ln of one minus x, has a radius of convergence of r equals one. If we want both of these series to converge, we have to restrict our attention to the smaller radius of convergence. So in this case, the radius of our sum is going to be r equals one. Now, strictly speaking, this logic isn't quite correct. The sum of two series will definitely converge over the smaller radius, but the actual radius of convergence of our sum might be a little bit larger. I mean, let's think about it. Suppose I add a power series of radius one to its negative. Now, both of those series have radius one, but the sum is zero. The sum has radius of convergence infinity. Now, this is a mistake in the course notes, but it's a fine technical point that we don't need to worry too much about. Let's just agree that if we add two power series together, the sum will converge over the smaller radius of convergence.